Hey there, folks. Uh, welcome back to our live streaming coverage of produced by 2014 at Warner Brothers. This is, of course, day two. And I am, of course, with here with John Sloss of Synetic Media. John, thank you so much for stepping up uh, to the plate here. Chris, my pleasure. All right. So you uh, are just <coughs> stepping off the stage of your uh, session, VOD, Blessing or Curse. Minutes ago. And, and I guess my that's, a, that's an easy first question. VOD, Blessing, Curse. Uh, what, what, it's, what it's a, uh, oddly enough, it's an irrelevant question. It's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. I mean, I consider the movement toward transparency and economic efficiency to be a positive development. Um, but no, no curse involved. <laughs> so talk about, about, uh, about how VOD uh, has become you know, such an instrumental platform for independent filmmakers right now. What are, what are the options available to them and, and, and are they able to, to make a living off the, the license fees and you get from, from VOD? Well, uh, my colleague just informed me before the panel that, that their, uh, Pricewaterhouse just announced that next year will be the first year where digital revenues surpass DVD revenues. Really? Uh, and I think that is where the future is headed. Um, as long as we aren't all put out of business by piracy, uh, then yeah. movements toward efficient delivery and lower cost and better splits are good for filmmakers and good for producers. Um, for, for what kind of film or, or uh, what sort of audience? When does VOD make sense and when does it maybe not make sense for an independent Well, I think that's an ev ever-evolving question and we're at Synetic, we're sort of dedicated to looking at these models and looking at the um, flexibility and windowing and timing um, both with theatrical and with the different kinds of VOD and and linear TV and DVD and, and figuring out in each case what is the sort of optimal sequence for each film. Hmm. What are, can you give me an example of what some of those sequences might be? What, how do, what does the progression go in terms of its windows, say, for an independent film that's looking at a predominantly VOD uh, distribution model? Um, well, it's, you need to, obviously, the issue is to cut through the din and to draw attention to your film. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, one way to do it is to release it theatrically and get theatrical reviews. Mm -hmm. um, as Jason Janago pointed out in the panel, he looked last Friday, there were 24 films released theatrically. <laughs> You know, uh, arguably at least 17 of them probably shouldn't have been. They're going to be spending money that they'll never get back, that they won't succeed theatrically, and they won't draw attention to themselves. So the question becomes, if you are not going to be released theatrically, what are the opportunities that come for, for really drawing attention to yourself? And, uh, you know, a lot of that is evolving. Like I said, it has to do with sort of reorienting your thinking, who are the communities for your film, mm -hmm. you know, obviously every good film has a core community of, of cinephiles, but it has myriad other communities. I, I love to tell the story uh, that sort of uh, awakened me to these possibilities. It was about 15 years ago, I was a producer on a movie called Yuli's Gold by mm -hmm. Victor Nunez with uh, Peter Fonda, uh, and when we were in post, we started getting calls from uh, beekeeping societies who wanted huh. to book screenings of the film. I started thinking, uh, oh, okay. I need. We need to start thinking of who the communities are mm -hmm. that will embrace a film that will be the sort of core word of mouth base for the film, and find ways to market directly to them. I think that's an example. I mean, there are other examples on the panel of of how to sort of get priority of placement in terms of VOD and to get on the Barker and and right. there are all sorts of things that that it's incumbent upon producers to know. Right. Uh, yeah, Yuli's Gold, of course, had the, the handicap of being released before the age of like hashtag beekeepers.com. Yes. yes. Uh, how big a role does social media play uh, in uh, finding these communities that are so essential uh, to it, a film building? It's it's it, momentum. It's massive. I mean, I don't know how you would find them. I mean, I guess you would find them by getting calls from beekeeping society. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yeah, the opportunity of actually going to those communities, of targeting those communities, um, and through places like Vimeo, uh, of you know being able to make purchase available through the websites for those communities are just growing, you know, exponentially. Right. Now, I, I can't let you go without asking a, a quick question about Boyhood, which, as a as the guy who as a production challenge, uh, seems like just one of the most extraordinary stories, you know, of the last decade or so. How, how uh, the last a, twelve years last actually? The last twelve, yeah, <laughs> last twelve years. Exactly. Can you talk a little bit about how how that came uh, about and how you, as a producer, and how the team? Work to put this thing uh, together. It took a re it took a remarkable amount of luck <laughs> <laughs> to create to for that experiment to succeed that well, and a little bit of karma, I would say, because uh, Rick Linklater's got a lot of good positive karma. Uh, Twelve years ago, he and I went to see the Independent uh, Film Channel, and um, 
we 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 asked them if they would give us, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for 12 years to shoot four days a year of this scripted film, that they wouldn't have any chance to rec realize any return on for at least 12 years. <laughs> and insanely enough, uh, Jonathan Syrian said yes. Uh, and I think we'll be rewarded handsomely for it. I mean, hopefully everyone will go see the film when it's released July 11th at a theater near you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I, you can count on my being there, or at least getting yeah, us. Well, getting, please getting please tell 100,000 of your closest friends. All right, well, you, you heard it here first, folks. All those folks, well, all the, the 100,000 of you watching our live stream coverage uh, can turn out to I've, see I've it. I've been involved with about thing. 600 films. Yeah. This, is, this is the best film I've ever been involved with. Well, and, and that'll probably get me fired by many, many people. But, uh, <laughs> but I love this movie. Uh, it, it, it was a leap of faith for everyone. You can't, I mean, as a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, obviously, you, you can't bind people to personal services contracts for more than six years. Right. So we, we didn't know whether we'd have the rights, whether the people would show up every year. Uh, and they did, and the result is really better than we could have ever hoped for. Well, congratulations. It's, it's really a singular achievement uh, in this day and age. And, uh, Remarkable. So congratulations to you. Thank you. For that. All right. Thank you for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you. And I know you're, you're a veteran of our conference. I hope we get you back sometime yeah, soon. Yeah. No, I love coming out for Bruce by conference, and I'm a huge supporter of the PGA. All right. Well, thanks for being a part of it, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Chris.